Let's listen and enjoy the choir as they sing. Let's join in singing the first two verses of Great is Thy Faithfulness. Good morning and welcome to worship and can I say it's, it's uh, really good and no offence Alan please uh, uh, but it's really good to have two, two gentlemen in the choir and John it's great to see you uh, well enough to be here with us and, it's, and welcome to all those who are, uh, uh, are with us this morning for everyone is welcome here because everyone already belongs. So let us, each one of us, of every background and experience, every shape and color, accent and hairstyle, eye pigment and jawline, 
everyone that God has imagined. Let us be here in this belonging place and celebrate each other as we worship God together. Let's sing in the first hymn together for uh, harvest or harvest service, which I'm sure you'll agree is looking very colorful and uh, very, very tasteful indeed. And we thank Stella and the, uh, the, the, the flower, flower team for, uh, the, for bringing this together, particularly Stella, who was uh, uh, here yesterday. Let's sing in, we plow the fields and scatter. Let's pray. Loving God, may we pause within this world and in silence and in word, find the silences and words that you wish us to hear today. The silences and words that you hear in the corridors of heaven. May we be your people here and shape an open community beyond the rules of the world. May we recognize the gift of your kingdom where all belong. May we find our voice, loving God, and let it speak with truth and compassion, trusting that you hear each one of us. You recognize the cry we make that holds our heart, that expresses our need. May we make here a place of trust where your love and justice shapes all we are and all we can become. And that strength is enough for each one of us. Loving God, may we be together 
in this holy earthly community. Can we be the channel for your spirit that she might pour into our community and our world hope for the future and love for today? And now, together in one voice, can we share our worldwide prayer given by Jesus? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Listen now for a word from God from the New Testament. And just to confuse you, uh, the, before I turn over uh, to Marion, uh, I'll say that what is printed on your, uh, the, the, uh, your sheet there as being the reading is really just to give you a, a, a piece of reflection when you go home and see how you can tie in that reading with what we're saying today. So. So the reading this morning is from the Good News Translation of the Bible, and it's from John chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Jesus feeds 5,000. After this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, as it is also called. A large crowd gathered, sorry, a large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing the sick. Jesus went up a hill and sat down with his disciples. The time for the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked around and saw that a large group was coming to him. So he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. Philip answered, for everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother said, there is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. Make the people sit down, Jesus told them. There was a lot of grass there. So all the people sat down. There were about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed, distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, and when all had as much as they wanted. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces left over, let us not waste a bit. So they gathered them all and filled 12 baskets with the pieces left over from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Thanks very much. <clears throat> and let's sing now in When I Needed a Neighbour, Were You There?
Today is our harvest celebration. It's traditionally a time to give thanks, but even if we were in a rural community, very few of us would be directly involved in farming or in growing food because we are all dependent on a smaller number in our community and in the world for a greater quantity of food being produced nowadays. But this doesn't mean that we've got nothing to be thankful for to offer back to God. This year is the third decade of the 21st century, and we want to celebrate the harvest of our first 21st century lives. We want to give thanks for the hard work of our church and community and the harvest of our own lives, and then dedicate the harvest gifts of our world community to be shared, not just with the local community, but with the whole family of God's one world. And we'll hear more of that later. In the reading, the crowd was hungry. The place was isolated. It was late in the day. The crowd was large, and from the human point of view, the need seemed to be beyond anyone's capacity. But Jesus turned towards his disciples, and he passes over to them the responsibility for feeding the crowd. He looked round, and he saw that a large crowd was coming to him, and he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? So how do the disciples handle it? In Matthew's version of the story, the disciples suggest the problem of food should be left to the people, let them feed themselves. Send the people away, let them go to the villages to buy food for themselves. So first they say it's their problem, let them solve it. The next approach is, we haven't got the resources needed. For everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins, Philip says, to buy enough bread. And because they can't do everything to help, they would rather do nothing to help. That's so often the story of helping other people. And then Andrew stumbles on half a possibility. There's a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. They write off Jesus' ability to solve the problem. They limit Jesus in all their calculations. The disciples may have shared in Jesus' compassion that he had for the crowd and its hunger, but they didn't identify with his goodness and generosity, and they didn't trust him to provide a solution. The crowd is still hungry. The place is still isolated. The crowd is large. And from the human point of view, the need is beyond the capacity of Jesus and his disciples. That could be the story anywhere today in the 21st century. This could be in any continent today, or more correctly, on every continent today, in every community, in all the communities within Scotland and the United Kingdom. 5,000 is a small number in third world countries where as many as 50% of the population can live below the poverty line. And especially at harvest, God challenges us to see how we are going to help with that situation. And many, like the first followers, will say it's their problem let them solve it. And they determine to do nothing. But is it the problem 
of the people of Libya, of the people of Morocco, of the people of so many other countries who have been overtaken by the natural disasters that have happened. Others feel embarrassed that their offering would only be a drop in the ocean in relation to the needs of any particular situation. And if they can't do everything, they'll do nothing. Jesus didn't think that way. He didn't say you had to do everything in order to do anything to help. He said, no matter how small your offering is, that is given. It's how it's given, the attitude it's given in. That's what matters. A plate of soup produces food for today, and so it determines life for tomorrow. That's why we have and support the food bank. All indications are that they're going to continue to be very necessary, not only in the immediate future, despite all our hopes and vision that they'll become unnecessary at some point, hopefully within our lifetime. Others too will limit what could be achieved with a little. We limit God's grace. We become too cautious when we rely on ourselves and expect our own resources to be sufficient. It's God's grace, goodness, and power that work through our own insufficient gifts, however small we might think that they are. God accepts, uses, and honors even the small offerings that are given here for the work of sharing the harvest, of caring with compassion for his people in the wider world. To God, it is not the quantity which is important, it's the attitude. This harvest, can we give God what little we might feel we have so that he will multiply it to benefit our neighbors in Scotland, in Ukraine, in Libya, in the Americas, in so many Asian and African countries, wherever there is need, whatever little we have, can we share it? Let's sing in God whose farm is all creation. I'm going to ask you a question you might find a bit difficult, uh, but um, how often do we pause and look round at all the other people in church that we worship with and think how wonderful it is that we are together? 
I'm not going to ask you to put up your hands, so don't worry. <laughs> How much time do we spend marveling at our differences, the life experiences that have shaped the gathered wisdom of this community, the pain that we have shared collectively, with sometimes with those we hardly know, the choices and crises that have brought some of us to our knees and others singing out loud. The secrets we hold about ourselves we cannot voice for fear of the judgment of others. Uncertain who we are in the world or the concerns we hold about others that just ravage our peace and fill our anxieties. And yet, the fact that we are together and quantity didn't manage, didn't matter for God in harvest. So does quantity manage in today's world where people aren't asking questions of faith? Is it not more important the attitude of people who are here the community we shape, the worship we create together. It is something wonderful that we can fit in together and worship here. One of the regular themes which I'll, I've come to and I'll come back to again is that we belong, that we're a belonging church. It's far more gospel-shaped than any other definition of the church. Everyone belongs, whether we're aware of that or not. We belong even before we believe. Welcome is positive so long as it's not exclusive or conditional. Belonging is always unconditional. We welcome our guests but sometimes there can be an implication that this is our place and you are our guests here. So hopefully you'll fit in and become one of us. But think about it. Do you welcome one of your own family back into the home? No, you don't. Because that person already belongs there. And it's the same here. The writer Brené Brown said recently, the opposite of belonging is fitting in. Fitting in is about assessing a situation and becoming who you need to be to be accepted. Belonging, on the other hand, doesn't need us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are. Belonging celebrates our great diversity, and that diversity is the image of God. And maybe this is one of the few places left in our community where it's okay to be who we are, how we are at any particular time. Worship happens as a community where all are themselves and celebrate that diverse image of God we give worth to the breadth and depth of God's bold imagination and accepting love. I am the first to say that that's not always been the case for everyone in the average congregation of any denomination. Let's not be naive about that. Getting by belonging right can be difficult because it can seem to criticize us, impeach us, challenge us. But in celebrating everyone, the more our community reflects God's diversity, the more our worship gives worth to God's image. And that's what worship means. Worth-ship, worship, giving worth to God. So our worship isn't founded on 
the welcome offered alone. That's important, yes. But the belonging we all know, there's no need to fit in here. Just be yourself. This is our good news. It's seriously good news in the 21st century because there's a generation of people in Scotland and beyond who are adapting a way of life that is lonely, that's cut off from other people, where they live with others who only share the same values and they maybe stay in the same street for years and they don't know who their neighbors are. Those who think differently, those whom they haven't even spoken to, they say are not neighbors to love. That we should challenge. It's a generation uncertain about how to make community in its richest sense. A fit in community won't do. A community where all belong is what we're out to be part of. I listened to a podcast on the BBC from Adam Smith. Uh, I don't think he recorded it personally, but it was about Adam Smith. Uh, uh, It illustrates the Scottish Enlightenment a few hundred years ago, way before my time, I have to say, Uh, as a time of diverse and critical thinking, where in the coffee houses you would have great debates between scientists and anthropologists, mathematicians and theologians, moral philosophers and political thinkers. And that used to be part of the Scottish education, which you got even in the, the tiny schools that existed in every parish around Scotland in those days. Think of Robert Burns. It was about the same time. That bread grew a democracy of morality and ethics and a sense of belonging together. And that was our church too. The General Assembly, a great national melting pot of ideas rather than what, frankly, and possibly I shouldn't say this online, can be the dullest grey of the church today, where many have no real sense that they belong anywhere or to anyone. It concerns me that the church's mission is shaped by the assembly primarily around the idea of welcome, which can be conditional on our own terms. Its essential welcome is included in our mission, but more significant is creating communities of belonging which are unconditional, which accept everyone, which are richly diverse. Maybe the greatest thing we can do for the mission of the church is simply to continue to focus on creating here a place of grace-filled belonging and the diversity and openness and acceptance of everyone that that requires. Whenever we have a mission to become a community of belonging, not of fit-ins, it's comfortable and nice to fit in, but that's not enough. We can lay the foundation if we are belonging and everyone else feels they belong. For a future congregation that's creative, imaginative, that celebrates God's image for the 21st century, and there's still a lot of the 21st century to go, that offers God our worth and offers God our worship. Can we strive to let everyone feel that we belong. How do we belong together? Such diversity of opinions, 
Each of us speaks differently of love or spirit or presence or God because we don't all shame the sa- share the same experience of God. A belonging place where each of us holds different questions with integrity about history and story, about what's literal, about what's grown in the telling, where each of us flows between truth and myth in the telling of our stories, of water walking, storm stilling, or crowd feeding. Truth or myth, which one holds more meaning about our human condition? How might we listen to others and be listened to by others in a place where all belong? Belonging is a generous place, a disturbing place, a respectful place, an honest place, a place that doesn't leave anyone out. In there, where we let ourselves be unwound unwound a little in the presence of others who support us by holding our fraying threads and sharing our pains, in there where we all belong because we are loved just for who we are. May that be so. Let's sing now and for the fruits of all creation. The intimations are in your hands. Everyone is welcome to tea or coffee after the service or uh, some other beverages which are on on offer as well. Uh, So um, the coffee shop is on Tuesday morning in the North Hall at 10 o'clock and the bowling club at 2 on Monday. Uh, The warm spaces, uh, the think, which is going to be called the Thursday Club, somebody told me. Um, if I'm wrong there, then you can correct me. But uh, the, it's from two till four every Thursday, and there are lots of different activities, and I think more are even being looked at to be added uh, to come along and share. 
Uh, the Beetle Drive uh, is on Wednesday night. Uh, tickets are available. Um, and uh, next Sunday, there will be uh, soup, tea and coffee after the, uh, the, <coughs> the service. Everyone's welcome to, uh, to share. There are still some Herald magazines, I think, to, to be uplifted from the, uh, the fellowship area. Thanks to all who have contributed so generously to the food bank and uh, can say that it will be put to good news and the following items are given there. Uh, and then next Saturday, uh, we are hosting the Air Churches Together uh, at 11 o'clock with prayers of, for the peace of Ukraine and Russia. And uh, you'll get um, uh, <coughs> apologies to Denise and John, but uh, since we're not in, in uh, Edinburgh, uh, you, you'll not have had your tea, so you can get, you, you can get your, <laughs> your, your tea or, or coffee uh, when you come. Uh, and then uh, advance notice of the BB dedication service is there. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, um, there will be just a, a word about our sharing of our harvest uh, with those in need. Alan, would you like to? Good morning. Uh, it's me again. Um, you've all seen this on the news, uh, and you've all said, oh my goodness, how can these people survive? Christian Aid have decided to issue an appeal for the folk in Libya who have suffered such terrible devastation due to floods. The floods were caused by uh, an unexpected and huge storm but was contributed to by the fact that two dams burst. Dams aren't supposed to burst, but these were earth dams and they couldn't take the weight of the water. Now, I don't know if any of you have been involved in floods or a flood like that, but I have. I lived and worked in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia and an earth dam burst and flooded the center of the city. The devastation was nowhere near what the Libyans have put up with, but it, the, the scenes that I witnessed, cars looked as though they'd been turned out of some kiddie's uh, toy box, scattered around, stacked on top of one another. If you can imagine, in fact, go home today, and look at a level one meter above your floor, your ground floor, and everything up to that one meter is totally destroyed, soaked, totally irreplaceable. A friend of mine lost mementos that are totally irreplaceable. It's not something that you want people to experience or go through, but these people are going through it. So Christian Aid have issued an appeal to help relieve some of the pain and suffering. There are some Christian Aid envelopes. I'm asking you for money again. Um, and I would like to say that I would like to apologize, but in this case, I'm not going to apologize. Christian Aid envelopes out, out the front on the table. If you do find your, your, that you can contribute, please fill it in and return them. And please remember to fill in the gift aid slip if you do pay tax, because that makes a huge difference to the amount of money that is sent off. So we'll, if you forget to take a Christian aid envelope, don't worry about it. A normal white or brown envelope will do just as well. I'm not that, I'm not that pernickety. So we'll give it, what, two weeks? Yeah. Two weeks. Mm. So next Sunday, bring them back to the Sunday after. And I thank you very much in anticipation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks.
And I, as I <coughs> said, said a few times, it's not how much we're able to give, it's the fact that we, we want to give that counts. And however little it might seem uh, compared to the, the huge expenditure that's going to be involved for the, the Libyan people, that will still help somewhat in, in being able to be uh, an encouragement to others as well. So if you can, uh, please do uh, give something. Uh, having sp spoken about belonging, can we let everybody round about know they belong uh, here and wish them uh, the welcome to worship and also give them the hand of friendship? Oh yeah, I've, I've always got cold times. Yeah. Morning. Morning. Morning, Susan. Morning, Ida. Morning, Douglas. Let's bring our prayers for other people. Let's pray. At this time of harvest, as we give thanks for all we have been given and for your gracious provision for all our needs, we take time to remember those who don't have enough, those who live in areas of the world where natural disaster or human greed has robbed the earth of its richness and has denied people their chance to share in your gift of life. We pray for all who work to restore the land and renew the harvest. We think especially of the people of Libya, of Morocco, of the African countries that are starved by the Ukrainian conflict and the stopping of shipping of grain, of all who experience floods or droughts in their country. We pray for those who have been excluded by injustice and oppression from sharing in any harvest, for those who have no land to farm, for those who have no opportunity to learn for those who have inadequate health care, may your gifts be shared among all of your people and not stored up by the few to the exclusion of many. We pray for those who are the farmers and the creators of the harvest, who mine the wealth of the land and the sea in our country and beyond. Thank you for their diligence and determination, often in the face of considerable odds, for their skill at providing for the needs of our people. Share in their frustration and difficulties as they wait for remaining good weather to complete their last harvest, as they struggle against all of the difficulties of inflation and worldwide economic problems. We pray also for those whose skills and talents haven't been nurtured, but have been ignored and neglected. Help us to see your gifts in each and every individual, to recognize their diversity and encourage the use of everyone's talents. Help us to remember that everyone has skills to offer and that none is more important than any other. 
We pray for those who know a harvest of suffering in their lives just now. We think of those ill in their own homes, in our hospitals, or on their last journey of care in our hospice. Those who recover from treatment or await diagnosis, those who are about to undergo treatment. Our hearts go out to all who have been bereaved recently and to those who carry the pain of long experienced grief. Let each know that your comfort and consolation, support and strength are longer lasting than any of the pain that we experience in loss. We pray for those who are anxious because of the cost of living cries and the limitation that imposes on people's everyday existence. And in the silence of our hearts, we pray for our families and friends and ask you to show us how we can share in your care for them. Thank you that here in your love and everywhere in your love all belong. Help us to hold on to that truth in this coming week and long beyond. So be it. Amen. Let's <coughs> sing now in Praise God for the Harvest. Go now in peace. Go as those whose cup of life runs over, at least sometimes in some places in life. Go as those who have received bread enough for others. And may the faithfulness of the Creator be spread before us. 
Jesus, host our every meal. The Holy Spirit, fill us with a joy that goes deeper even than the pains of life. And the blessing of God, our Creator, our companion, our comforter, give us a sense of belonging this day and through all of next week. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Mm -hmm.